Hey everybody, it's Chris Guns. Welcome back to Pro Boxing Insider Radio. And I'm about to talk to Mighty Ivan Robinson. I know all you hardcore fans out there are going to know Mighty Ivan. And his wars with Arturo Gotti. Both of which he won. And the first one was voted Fight of the Year by Ring Magazine in 1998. He was a standout amateur who fought three really close fights with Oscar De La Hoya in the amateurs. And a lot of people think he won all three of them. But he got no no decisions, and he went on to be one of the most exciting fighters of the 90s. So let's get Philadelphia's favorite son, or one of them anyway, on the phone right now. Let's get Mighty Mouse on the phone. Mighty Ivan Robinson, how you doing, man? I'm good, baby. I'm good. How are you? I'm good, good. Thanks for joining us. No problem, no problem, sir. Not a problem at all. So let, let's talk about your growing up, Ivan. You're from Philadelphia. Were you born there, too? Yes, I was born and raised in the city of Brotherly Love, as they call it. You know what I'm saying? Um, I started boxing at the age of five. My dad took me to the gym at five. At the age of five, back then, you know, we could, we can go in the gym as early as we want, and we can train as long as we were, I guess, as long as we wanted to do it, and, and we were ambitious to do it. And, you know, I was young at that age, five, you know, going to the gym, knowing that's what I wanted to do, but at the same time, I'm a kid. You know, I did a lot of playing, pulling around and stuff like that. And uh, I guess the great thing about that was that my dad had really, really good patience. And I must have did that for about a year or two until a young man named Johnny Sellers, he got a hold of me and my dad. And, you know, and my dad worked together and they trained me. And, you know, God forbid, uh, Johnny Sellers, I think he passed away in 93. He was with me from, you know, I don't know if I can tell nobody, but he was with me from the, from the year of 1976 until, you know, he passed in 92, 93. So, um, you know, um, I had a great career with him. Um, I, uh, quite as kept, he taught me everything that I know. You know, my dad just, you know, polished up. My dad was a great trainer too, but Mr. John was the one that did all the, the you know, teaching spending time with me in the gym and uh, making sure that um, all my uh, form my form and my techniques and everything was right and great thing and good thing he did because I turned out to be a great champion and I'm very glad that a lot of people in the world you know turned out to really enjoy what I've done for a living mm -hmm. and, and tell me about the Robinson household take me inside there what was it like uh <laughs> it, it was it was great. Um, uh, you know, my mom and dad. Vivian was my mother, and James was my dad. My dad was a, a hardworking guy. Um, he did numerous jobs, but he was basically he was a cook. My mom back then was called a uh, housewife. She made sure that you know we uh, went to school. We did the proper things in school. Uh, she taught us things around the house. You know, like cleaning, uh, Friday and Friday and Saturdays were basically our days from school. We got to do, you know, certain things that we wanted to do as long as we under the guidelines of the Robinson, you know, rules. Um, we spent, I spent a lot of time with my family. I got two younger brothers. Um, uh, one of, one of my middle brother next to me, his name is Kareem Robinson. I mean, the main Robinson. My brother is, my baby brother is Kareem Robinson. Of course, both of them box, but, you know, <laughs> I don't like to toot my own one, but I was better than both of them. <laughs> uh, no sisters at all. Um, it was just me and my two brothers, my mom and my dad. Mm -hmm. And my uh, my little dog, my little chihuahua dog named <laughs> Princess. <laughs> yeah, that's so, um, other than that, um, it was great. You know, um, my dad was loved throughout the community. Everybody in the neighborhood knew my dad. I couldn't do nothing. I couldn't walk. Uh, couldn't lie to nobody. Went back and told my dad what I did. So the community was very, very, uh, how can I say it? Uplifting, very uh, uh, like mind stuff for you know, things that the kids did in the community. Mm -hmm. um, we just, uh, we just a lovable uh, family, you know. Wasn't a family with a lot of money, you know. Uh, we got by, we got the things that we wanted as long as we were good in school. 
And I can't, you know, I can't say nothing more about it or nothing less. I'm just happy that I had the mother and the father that I had. Mm -hmm. And your dad brought you to the gym, you said. Were you, were you good right away at the age of five? Uh, you know, it's kind of crazy to, to say I, I was young. Mm -hmm. So um, I was so small in the gym that they gave me the nickname Mighty Moss. Mm -hmm. But um, by the age of, I believe, I would say nine, I was known throughout the, the city of Philadelphia as Mighty Mouse. Everybody wanted to see who I was, wanted to come watch me fight or perform, as you will say, um, because I just was that exciting kid, and I was very small. I think at the time when I started, I couldn't have weighed more than about maybe 50 or 60 pounds. You know, and um, I was just a ball of fun, mm -hmm. a lot of fire, um, a lot of spunk, and I loved, I just loved to compete. Um, but, you know, the household, the Robinson household, if you didn't go to school, if you didn't get a good education, if you weren't uh, doing what you were supposed to do, Pop took that from me. Um, he made sure that um, if I was going to box, my mom made sure that I worked hard in school. I had my face in the books. I wasn't on the phone talking to girls or nothing like that. I did what I had to do. And um, that's why I became so good. Uh, by the age of 11, you know, everybody knew who I was in school. You know, it wasn't nowhere that I couldn't go. And nobody didn't know. My teachers in elementary school knew who I was. So, you know, it was, it was a great time back then coming up. It was real good. Yeah, now, who, who would you see in the gym? At, at that um, when, time. I, when I was in the gym coming up, um, I used to spar with uh, Myron, Myron Teller, which was Myron Teller's uh, oldest brother. Um, I spar with guys named Choo Choo Charlotte Brown. Hmm. Uh, my cousin was Joe and Jeff Chan. I used to play around with him. Mm -hmm. um, I, I stayed in the gym all the time with, with Smoke and Joe Frazier. Um, I can't remember exactly what age. But uh, I had to talk to my dad. But I know I was the youngest kid to ever go to uh, uh, Greatest Four Prison and box in the gym. I mean, well, box in the prison. Back then, you could do that. Nowadays, you know, you can't do it. They don't. I don't even think they allow boxing in prison no more. Mm -hmm. But at the age, I guess I had to be in my teens. Well, my my single digits. You know, um, I was in Greatest Four Prison putting on. Um, a boxing exhibition and you know like i said everybody knew me throughout the city of philadelphia and probably throughout the tri-state area as my boss so yeah. when i went and performed you know the guys in prison loved me man it was just a great thing i don't remember it all i remember a little bit of it but mm -hmm. the remembrance of it that i have man it was a great feeling it's a great feeling to have yeah and that's great i heard prison that 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 fight fans know that because Bernard Hopkins learned how to fight there. Yeah, ain't no doubt. Bernard, I, if I'm not mistaken, I probably was there when Bernard was there. I'm not sure. I never asked him that. I got to talk to my dad about that and ask him about <laughs> that. But uh, back then they had, you know, a little mat mm -hmm. in the center of the floor. And all the uh, prisoners would, you know, gather around to make sure that, you know, we wouldn't fall out or wouldn't run out the... Uh, the little mat area, which was called a ring, and when they performed, they fed us, you know what I'm saying? We got a chance to talk to the inmates and things like that. It was just great, you know, it was a great thing. And my dad, I think we went like twice a month, you know, it was, it was real good, mm -hmm. it was a real good situation. And at that age, you were close to Joe Frazier, you said, what, what kind of relationship did you have with him? Well, you know, Joe was on his high at the time. You know, he was champion, you know, doing things like that. It was just great to be in his, go in his gym, train with him, you know, train around him, you know, train around a legend, mm -hmm. heavyweight champion of the world, and from the city of Burlington, where I was from, man, it was, it was great. But I, I don't, honestly, I don't think that even though it was great training with Joe Frazier and being around Joe Frazier, I think the best uh, training that I had of them all was when I went out to uh, Eastern Pennsylvania <laughs> when I was when I met Larry Holmes up at uh, Steve Trace camp, mm -hmm. and I think that I think that was the, I think that was the best of them all. Like meeting Larry Holmes, being around Larry Holmes, and at that time Larry Holmes was on the rise of becoming heavyweight champion of the world. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and it was great. Mm -hmm. What was it like watching Larry train? That impressed you so much? Um, just, you know, being around him, you know, knowing that he did the same thing I did, and his passion was was through the roof. You know what I'm saying? I didn't really know nothing about that, but his passion was so, so high. And then it, the time that he took to sit down and talk to me, you know what I'm saying, and, and tell me that I was going to be champ one day and that he was going to keep his eye on me, he was going to look out for me. And I mean, to hear something from, from a champion like that, hmm. for me to be so young, man, it was just, it was more than enough. It was mm -hmm. great. Wow. It's great to be. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. It's great to be from a, a city like that. It, it, what, what's the difference when you when you look at Philadelphia boxing now than how it was back then? Man, it's not the same. Uh, we don't have we just don't have the, um, the unity that we had coming up. Like I thought that when I was coming up, I came up in the seventies. I used to watch guys like Leonard Hagler, you know, John the Beast McGarry, mm -hmm. then Melody King, through Terry Norris, all those guys. Pernell, Sweet Pea Whitaker, Terrell Big, you know, all those guys. But when Len and those guys fought, those were the times that were, that's what made boxing so great, was those times that Len and those guys were around. I never thought that I would be in a situation like that. Just me wanting to be in a in a thrilling fight like a Hagler, like a Hagler Leonard, mm -hmm. or, or a Tyson... Morris Frazier or Tyson, uh, Riddick Bowe, you know, those type of fights. Me to even be in a fight that later on down in my career or when I'm done, people going to say to me when I'm walking the street, oh, hey, Robinson, I remember when you fought such and such. I mean, that that's a great feeling. I mean, you don't know, but that's a real great feeling. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And the thing about it, what's good about it, um, for me, um, even though we talk about the fighters before, it's like, we talk about Mike Tyson, how, how Mike Tyson was so good, so great as that. But then on the back burn, we always said, well, Mike Tyson did this. He got caught or he got jammed doing this or um, he started spending money crazy. I could, what makes it good for me is that even though people know the great fight that I had with Gaddy and I fought Man Freddy and I fought Chavez and this, that, and I was no one could ever say, well, Ivan Robinson, you know, uh, he was always in, in, in the limelight because he did this, because he did that. Everybody always wanted to just remember me because I was a great guy that was just a warrior. I fought Gaddy. I fought, it was like, you know, fighting, needles being stuck in me. I'm saying, we went to war. That's all everybody say, man, them fights were wars. I hate that people say that they were wars because I really don't want people to look at it that way. But if that's how they remember me by, man, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not happy. You know, and the best thing about it all is that I got the win. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It was a win situation for me. Yeah, yeah. Classic fights. Incredible. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And what, what kind of amateur uh, experience did you did you feel you have in retrospect? Man, you went everywhere in the I, world? What was it like? Amateur experience was, it was just crazy. It was through the roof. I mean, the first year that I, that I really... Uh, uh, started in the end. Well, not the first year, after, but when I was able to qualify to start going away to 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 the big nationals, it was crazy. The first year that I went, I beat everything in the city of Philadelphia, and then I went uh, to 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 the regionals where I was down in D.C. and I fought Sean Bay Mitchell, and at that time, Sean Bay Mitchell. He was, I think he was a year older than me, but he already had been to the Nationals the year before. So he was like their prime pet, you know. And nobody really, I mean, I had a local name, but and a lot of people knew me all over the world, but they never seen me. You know, like for me to fight somebody mentioned, and then for me and him to fight, to the fight that we did, it was so close. I lost to him, and I was hurt. But, you know, with me being the competitor that I am, I told him right in the ring, I said, look, we're going to fight again next year. And next year, when I fight you, I'm going to knock you out. And, you know, he all, uh, man, you ain't, okay. Next year, I beat everything. Got to the regional for me and him again. Fought him again in his backyard, and I stopped him in his backyard. And, you know, it was just amazing because, you know, I'm young. I'm ambitious. I'm a hothead. 
Mm-hmm. I know I can fight a little bit, but you know, I'm I'm great fight guy that's a national champion has been to the national and for me to go tell this guy I'm gonna knock him out, I mean that's kinda crazy, but at that time that's how I felt. And I came back and I did it. I beat everything and then I was going to uh I was going to the junior Olympics. That's why I was gonna go to uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Never been on a plane, never been outside the city of Philadelphia except for a car ride. Mm-hmm. Never forget it. My mom and dad woke me up that morning to get me ready to take me to the airport. My uncle Tahi, he, because he was like, he was like my chauffeur. Wherever I, wherever I needed to go in the tri-state area to a fight, he took me. So he was taking me to the airport. He took me to the airport. My mom and dad walked me to the gate, and I never forget it. They, they said uh, loading airplanes such and such and going to Raleigh, North Carolina. We starting to board. So my mom and dad was like, look, you got to go get on the plane. I'm like, what? they like, you got to go get on the plane. I'm like, y'all leaving? they like, yeah, we can't go. They ain't give us anything. You got to go. Man, I cried so bad. It was crazy. I cried so much <laughs> that my dad had to go talk to the flight attendant <laughs> to make sure that she made sure that I got to Raleigh, North Carolina, and I was going to be sitting on my feet, and I was going to be safe. So I got there. Everything was good. Cause it was a new atmosphere for me because I didn't know nobody. I get there um, on a flight going there. I had to, I think I had to stop. I can't even remember where I stopped at, but I remember meeting guys from California. So you know, I was with them the whole time. I get to the room. We stays with them. Well, I stays with them. You know, we talking. We having a good time. Next day is the weigh-ins. So we goes to the weigh-in. We sit at the way. I'm with them now. Now, I didn't know Region 2 was the region I was really originally from, which was like Philadelphia, Washington, Baltimore, all that over there. Um, the only person that I knew of and that was a, out, that was a standout person was Mark Johnson. Mm-hmm. And the reason I knew Mark Johnson was on my team because me and Mark started talking, but... When they call our names, it's like Region 2, can you please step forward, come up, we need to get y'all weighed in. So when they start naming people, they, they named me, and I was out in the hallway. And um, Mark Johnson's dad, Ham Johnson, was like, everybody was like, we never seen this kid, we don't know who he is. Mark was like, I was just talking to him. So they was like, Mark, go get him. So Mark came out and got me. So I'm like, what's up, Mark? It was like, Mark was like, yo, you on our team? I was like, huh? I like I'm with these guys right here. They like, no, nah. Mark's like, no, nah, you with us, man. Come on. So we went over there, we weighed in and everything. And um I had a great, great tournament. I went all the way to the finals, but I lost to Emma Linton from Tacoma, Washington, who won the the the, uh, the championship, the nationals the year before. In the same week division that I fought him in, which was one nineteen. But I thought I beat him, but he was a tall kid. He was a softball, and he was from Tacoma, Washington. He was good, too, but I still thought I'd be. He even thought that I'd be, mm. but they gave him the decision. So, you know, after that, me and Emmett became real good friends. Yeah. Next year um, was uh, 89. I went, um, performed again, went all the way, but then I lost. So what I did that year, I could move up to open class. So I moved up to open class. And what happened, Coach Pat Naffy, who was the coach of the Olympic team for God knows how long, he spotted me. And they didn't have a 125-pounder to represent the United States and Canada. So I got the call to go. And that was my first time going out to an international tournament where we was in Canada. And we was fighting against Canada, Yugoslavia, and two other countries. I won, I won everything up to the finals. My first tournament, 89, I, I was the Canadian Cup. I'll never forget it. Um, I fought a kid from Canada. This kid was strong. He was good, too. I think he was like 19. And he was like two-time Canadian champion. And um, he was real strong. He gave me trouble in the first round. But the second and third round, I turned it up. And um, I, won a, I won a tournament. I was the first and only American <laughs> to win a gold medal in the Canadian Cup in like seven years. 
Mm-hmm. So that was a good accomplishment for me, and for me to win my first gold national medal. Man, that was, man, that was great. I couldn't stop calling my mom and dad mm-hmm. and telling them about uh, about the gold medal that that was so. When I flew back home, um, as a guy who was a sports writer named Bernard Fernandez, he covered my career from the time that I won the Canadian Olympic gold medal until. I had those brands so I finished my pro career. But he was a great guy, man. He, uh, he used to come to my house every Sunday, talk to my dad and my mom, had coffee with him. I'd be outside playing basketball, football, baseball. He's sitting in my mom's living room drinking coffee and talking. <laughs> I'm, I'm outside playing some other type of sport. And that was another thing that was good about my dad. Um, he understood that I love boxing. And I was good, but he also let me become, he let, well not become, he let me be a boy. He let, during the summer, I had, I think I was the only kid that had the whole summer off from boxing. That means I couldn't pick up a glove, means I couldn't put on no hand wraps. If I ran, I just ran, but I couldn't jump no rope. My dad didn't want to, but I couldn't let my dad find out I was doing none of that. Because if I did, he would beat me. So the summer was for me to do whatever I wanted to do. And basically, the summer I did, um, I played baseball. I played a little bit of football, and I played a little bit of basketball. But my, like I said, my dad was the hardworking guy out of the family. He made sure the family was good, but he also was a very disciplined guy. My dad made sure, even though I wanted to box, he made sure that um, education was number one. I mean, at the age of 14, 15, my dad had me selling water ices, selling pretzels. Hmm. All that time. I mean, I didn't mess around and do nothing during the summer. I mean, I, I was right in front of my steps. I sold um, pretzels, water ice, and soda. My dad told me, made sure he taught me how to count money. Hmm. Then when I started making money and I was able to buy my own supplies for my little car stands or whatever you want, we see start taking me places, start going to like the corners of the busy highways and selling what I can sell. My dad was very, um, uh, how can I say it, uh, very articulate. I mean, he knew how to do things. My dad is very good with money. Um, he, you know, he, he wasn't, he just was a type of guy, he just didn't take no mess. And for him to be my trainer, to be my dad, to be... Oh, everything, man. You, you you can't ask for you can't ask for that. I mean, he was he was he was a good dude. Yeah, and you you're still you still uh, live close by your dad, right? You, yeah, I still live close still by my dad now. And your mom too. Your mom's still around. And my mom, yeah, my mom and dad are still together. They okay. still married after I want to say forty some years. Yeah, wow. That's, yeah, I know, that's right? Incredible. That's incredible. Wow, that is crazy. It's incredible, man. Soulmates, I guess. Yeah, and you know, it's crazy because, you know, come, when, in our time coming up, when we heard our parents arguing and stuff like that, we got mad or whatever, you know, but we understood it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? We understood mm-hmm. why they did what they did. Nowadays, I don't know, it's, it's totally a whole lot different. The kids are different, you know, the times are different. Nothing. Really, nothing is the same no more. Yeah. But, you know, you got to live and let live. Mm-hmm. Like yep. Floyd Senior said, live and let live. Yep. And you said it. And you uh, mentioned, you mentioned like, uh, being and going out to California and being cool with Mark Johnson. What, what do you think of Mark Johnson making the Hall of Fame? Man, I, you know, I, 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 I Facebooked him because I've been trying to get his number, but I can't get his number. And Mark always been... The type of guy who always stayed to himself, and I mean, he was Mark was a great fight. I, I mean, I love Mark. I mm. love the heck out of Mark. Mark was like my brother, you mm. know. And it was just great to see him, you know, do the things that he did. I always thought that he would be a better pro than he was an amateur. Um, at one time, I didn't understand why Ham was so hard on him, but you know, nowadays that I think about it. You had to be that way, you know what I'm saying? You, you definitely had to be uh, hard on your kids coming up because 
we didn't know no better, you know what I'm saying? And we needed that guy. And um, Ham Johnson, guys like Ham Johnson, my dad, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Emmanuel Stewart, Bowie Fisher, you know, all those trainers, man. We need, I mean, those guys ain't around no more. Mm -hmm. You know, those guys, that, that's what made boxing what it is today, you know, and, and it was just great. It was mm -hmm. just great. And you fought Sharon Bay Mitchell in the amateurs, right? You you fought. Yeah, I don't, I don't fought. Man, I fought everybody. I fought Sharon Bay Mitchell in the amateurs. Um, I don't remember if you remember uh, Frank Pena. He died a mm -hmm. couple years ago. Mm -hmm. I fought him. He was like, he was like the number one guy in my mm -hmm. weight division. And when I beat him, it was like I was, you know, I was the man then. But mm -hmm. I wasn't the man too long. But then come Oscar. <laughs> but you know. It was just, you know, great to have. I don't know. I guess it's it's good, like with Batman and Robin and Superman and the Hulk and you know the Justice League. It's always good to have villains because if you have a villain, that that's what makes you great. And you know, God forbid, I like the I like the fact that I had the guys like Oscar De La Hoya around, uh, Arturo Gotti, um, guys like you know. Chavez, who's a lot older than me, but still, you know, when you have guys that you can put your name in in the in the in the pot with, and you can still stand out with those guys, uh, that's a great feeling. That's a really a great feeling. Yeah, and w you fought Oscar three times on the amateurs. What what was he like on the amateurs when you when you fought Oscar? Uh, well, the first yeah, I fought him, which was crazy about it too. Um, I fought him, the first year I fought him, I fought him uh, in 89. After I won the gold medal in Canada, I, I went to, the, uh, which at the time was called the ABF, Amateur Boxing Federation Tournament, and I went all the way to, uh, to, the, uh, to the finals. And um, I lost to... I can't even remember who I lost to that year. So what I did, I came back. My dad put me in the uh, Golden Gloves. Uh, I wouldn't say that the uh, Pennsylvania Golden Gloves was easy, but a lot of the guys that, that were in Pennsylvania that I fought, you know, they weren't more bonds. They was like rivals. I beat all of them. Uh, then it was given by the regionals. I won the regionals. And then we was headed out to Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, to the Pennsylvania Golden Gloves, and um, that was a great thing. Um, you know, I had a bunch of guys out there at Ford. Um, now, I never knew that, you know, you were in two different brackets. Now, the bracket that I was in was uh, opposite side of Oscar De La Hoya bracket. I didn't even care about Oscar bracket. I didn't even care who Oscar was. Didn't know him nothing like that, but evidently everybody else paid attention to him. So, what was funny about it you would never guess who was my coach for the Pennsylvania Golden Brothers. Now, we talk about Pennsylvania, which is Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Harrisburg, Lancaster, you know, those type of little small old regions that make up uh, Pennsylvania. But you would never guess who was the head coach of um, the Pennsylvania Golden Brothers boxing game. Hmm. Who was it? Boris Frazier. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> now, could you could you really uh, think by me being a boxer and Marvin Frazier being a slugger? What actually would Marvin Frazier tell me to do in the ring? No, mm -hmm. but I mean, it was good having him because um, you know he was an icon. His dad was a legend. Mm -hmm. You know, God God rest his soul. But you know, Joe was a re uh, legend, and his father. I mean, him. You know, riding the coattail of his dad. He got a good name. So, to make a long story short, you know, Marvin's working my corner the whole fight. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people are, like, you know, in my corner expecting me to win. So, you know, they ride my coattail throughout. You know, everybody have, but, you know, there's never scissors out of the La Jolla. Mm -hmm. we, we never seen him fight. We didn't even look at him fight. Because a lot of times I fought before him, and he would fight after me. And after I fought, my thing was get back to your room, eat and get rest because I fought at 125 but I always weighed like 119, 120. So I never had a problem making weight. 
That wasn't a problem. So after after he wins and I win, I find out who I'm fighting. I goes back to the room. I don't want to hear nothing. I just go back to the room and lay down. So I, Marvin and I'm staying behind. I guess they was getting a scoop on his kid. So Marvin told me that the kid was real strong from his left side, which that means the octa had a real. For some reason, they say he was a converted softball. Mm-hmm. He was very strong from his left side. He had a great left hook. He had a tremendous jab. That was just, you know it. So what I did, I always called my dad the night before the fight or earlier that day. So I told him who I was fighting, and I told him a little bit about Oscar, but we didn't know a lot about him. So, make a long story short, we fought him. Um, the fight, like I said, everybody knew about Oscar, so... For some reason, he was like the favorite. So I got a shot on TV and didn't even know it. I got a shot on TV, and God forbid, my dad just happened to turn it on. And he seen me fighting, and he was really, really upset because um, he said that I I know how to fight without my dad. I was just that type of guy. I knew how to fight. I always knew how to adjust. And he said that I didn't make the... the the uh, minor adjustment that I need to fight to win to beat Oscar, but I thought I beat him because I thought I landed the the more punches. I thought I landed collect, co- uh, correctly and clean. Of course, he hit me with some good shots, but I think out of the five fights he had, I think he knocked out like three of his opponents. So I wasn't even supposed to go. I wasn't even supposed to be in two rounds with him, mm. but I fought hard. Everybody across the world seen a fight, especially everybody here at home, and um. Well, I didn't get the decision. It, it was it was a hurt piece. And, you know, when I got off the plane and I got back, I had a whole bunch of people, that, my family, friends, all came, told me that um, I won the fight. Uh, now, I'm just getting off a plane from Knoxville, Tennessee, losing to the number one ranked amateur in the world, and I'm the number two guy. I'm losing. I just lost, like, 24 hours ago. I just lost <laughs> to... The number one ranked amateur in the world. I get home off the airplane in Philadelphia to greet my dad and my mom and all my friends. And you know what the heck my dad tells me I have to do? What's that? <laughs> I have to run. No. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Well, I mean, who okay. tells they kid that after he just fought the best fight mm-hmm. of his, he think his life. But you know what? I was, I ne- like I told you, I, I never, I was never scared of nobody, but I kind of feared my dad. And see, back then, those were the things that made life so good because if your mom or your dad put their foot down, you straightened up. Mm-hmm. Didn't give no back talk, you didn't want to say nothing. And you know, if you did say something, you knew something was coming at you. Mm-hmm. And if you didn't know how to duck a block, <laughs> you was going to get caught. Yeah. So yeah. what I did... I went downstairs, went to the tunnel, <laughs> made sure I got my bags, made sure my dad got them, threw them in the car, and what I do, I ran my butt home. Mm. Yeah. And then when he got there, what I had to do, I had to train. So I just fought six minutes for a hard six minute fight with the world champion and loses, and they gotta go home the next day and train. That's crazy. Mm. Yeah. But you know, my dad was just eager for me to beat Oscar the next time we fight. Yeah. So, so you know, we trained again, and uh, we got ready for, again, which was the ABF, the Mid-Atlantic Boxing Association. We got ready. We beat everybody. Um, we fought the kid Frank Pena. We beat Frank Pena, uh, which was a high-decorated fighter. I think he was, like, number one in that, in that division, in that tournament, because Oscar then performed but then fighting that that year, he was like me. We just jumped in the Golden Gloves. So um, Penny was still a guy to beat. So I guess they must have wanted him and Oscar to fight. So they put him in my division and thought that he was going to beat me. But I spanked him that year. And I fought Oscar again on TV. Everybody knew this was a rematch fight. I mean, man, my dad trained me so hard. He got me in the right boxer. My determination for that tournament was nobody but Oscar. 
was nobody going to stand in my way because my dad drilled me. He trained me. He woke me up in the middle of the night. He talked to me. He walked me to school talking to me about how to beat this kid. So it was no way, no if, no way, no how, no how about of getting out of it. It was just going to be me and Oscar. And that's what it was. And everybody seen it. Everybody loved it. And then once again, uh, I came up short, sir. Hmm. And that was not good. That was not good at all. But, hmm. you know, I think, you know, um, like I said, the best thing that was coming out of that was that um, everybody knew who I was. Everybody knew that I was a great fighter. And at that time now, everybody was sitting there talking, wondering how, you know, the Olympics, how the Olympic team was going to be picked because, they knew it was two champions in the same division, but you could only take one. And they knew if I wasn't going, or if I wasn't the number one guy, I wasn't going. So, you know, I had to work hard again. And God forbid this time, um, we both were, um, we both were at large guys. But what happened, I actually got picked to go on a trip. I think he got picked to go on a pre-Olympic trip or something like that. He got to go on. And he went out there, he won it. So I got a chance to fight in the Mid-Atlantic tournament and hopefully win a gold, which I did. But what happened was Oscar got a large bid, and it was uh, we was getting ready to fight in the Google Games. So what happened, we were United States and Russia were the two teams or the two countries that got a chance to take two guys in the same weight class. Mm -hmm. So it was me and... Um, Man, Oscar from the United States in one division from the United States, and Russia had another team. But you know, they separated us. We both fall in two different, you know, two different brackets. But at the same time, uh, the night before, they showed both our uh, both our fights. Oscar fought the kid from Germany, and I fought the kid from Russia. Uh, Oscar beat his kid. I wasn't supposed to beat my kid because the kid was great, but God forbid, I stopped him in three, which was the third round. I stopped him so that shut up Oscar De La Hoya, Ivan Robinson fight. This time, it didn't matter. I was going for the kill. I was just, I just planned on killing him. And I came out in the first round. I didn't do what I said I was going to do. I pretty much box, box, box. Look for the, for the second and third round. I tried to tear his head all. I mean, completely tear his head. And everybody knew it. I was just going for the kill. I thought I was landing the hardest shot. I thought I was landing the cleanest shot. But once again, I didn't get the decision. Uh, Coach Pat Nabby, who coached the Olympic team for God knows how long, he was upset. All the sports writers was upset. Even, um, remember Larry King? Mm -hmm. uh, he did. He uh, even, uh, he was uh, commentating the fight. And um, he even said, he was like, I look at fights all the time and I just fight. There was no way that I lost off that fight. And I think that fight, that last fight with Oscar, really put me over the threshold because it was just, it was just amazing. I just, I don't know. Everybody, I mean, I got a lot of credibility on that fight. Everybody loved me. I got a lot of respect. And I think I got so much respect that I still say that I, I um, I edged it on, but a lot of people say he was getting too big to make that weight. Oscar declared, or he said in a press conference after I fight, that he was moving up to 132 pounds. I couldn't move up because, like I said, I was fighting 25, but I was coming in at like 20, 21. I think I was the only guy on that Olympic team or on that team for the last four years that was making that weight like that. Hold on a second. Yeah, so, um, you know, that was uh that was a uh, ninety that was ninety one. Mm -hmm. And so the... after that, um, I declared that I wanted to be the number one guy. Twenty five, I won everything. I won twenty five in the states, and after that, I won everything in the states for uh, at one thirty two. So we happened to uh, both uh, go to the pre Olympics, which was like. Earlier the year before, in Sydney, which was in Sydney, Australia, mm -hmm. where the Olympics was going to be held at, we went out there and um, 
Uh, I lost to a Korean dude. Yeah. I don't know how I lost. I lost him by two points, but I was beating the crap out of him. <laughs> and you know, at the end of the decision, I never forget the score. The score was forty six, forty eight. I was like, damn, this is a basketball score. <laughs> so um, uh, even though I lost, and I said that um, I was just gonna go back home and uh, uh, dedicate myself to uh, getting ready for Olympics. <laughs> now after. It's crazy what he did. He lost to the German. And he lost to the German. I don't I don't think it was bad, but he thought it was bad. He thought it was so bad. We had spent the whole month in Sydney Australia. Normally what they used to do, like if you lose early, they would send you home the next day. Like if you lost on a Monday, and the tournament basically was a, like a Friday tournament. So... The closer you got to the tournament, I mean, the closer you got to the championship, they wouldn't see them. Like, if the championship was Friday and I lost on Thursday, I would stay Friday. But I lost on Tuesday, so they sent me home. Oscar lost on Tuesday. They didn't send him home, but he stayed in his room the whole time that we was out there. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> he, he, and what's so crazy about it, like, my room was across from his. And, you know, we Americans, you know, we we, we know money, but we like to spend money. We, we, we was ordering pizza, eating stuff every night. We would get it ordered to our, we would get it uh, delivered to our food. And when they come, you know how you open the door and you pay. Oscar would not open the door and pay for his food. He would stick the money up under the door hmm. and tell them to leave the food out there. <laughs> and they leave. And then he would come open the door and get his food and close the door back. Wow. We thought something was wrong with him. Yeah. But he had told us the <laughs> night before he did that, that he um, got rest his soul because, you know, his mom was sick too at the time. Mm -hmm. She was dying. And he had said that he was going to dedicate his rest of his amateur career to his mom and he was going to want to go medal. And when he came out, we left to go home that night. But that that right before the Olympics was over because everybody had lost. So we had left like that Thursday. When we left to go home, we didn't know who I school was. He had grown a beard. His hair had grown. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He was stuck in the room. And Raul Marquez was his roommate. Raul Marquez didn't even stay in the room with him. Raul Marquez stayed in. I can't even remember who room he stayed in, but he stayed in all the fighters' room like each night. He was in somebody else's room because... I still didn't want to be bothered. I still didn't want to talk to nobody. He didn't do nothing. But when we left to go home back to the state, and we didn't know who I was. Man, he had grown so much hair. He was a different dude, but he was on a mission. Mm -hmm. You know, and, um, you know, he did good because evidently he made the Olympic team and he won a gold medal. Eventually, I fought um, a kid from a... Uh, from the Navy called Julian Wood. Man, that guy could beat me if I was, if I was sick on a bad day, he couldn't beat me. But for some reason, he beat me in the, in the, in the, in the trials, and then he turned around. And what happens is, number one and number two guy, if you get beat in the trials, you have to fight in a boxer. So he beat me in the trials. Then I had to turn around like two weeks later and fight him again in the boxer. And um, I'm out. Fought him, lost him in the trial, then I turned around and fought him again and lost him in the box up. And it was just crazy because they were saying that the 92 Olympic team was supposed to be like the 76 Olympic team. And me and Oscar was supposed to be favorites to win a gold medal, no matter hands down. We were supposed to be favorites to win a gold medal, but, you know, it didn't happen. So, um, uh, when they went to the Olympics, they called me and asked me did I want to be an alternate. And I told them, I said, no, I said, why would you want me to be an alternate to get to get Oscar ready for him to go out there? and I mean, for Julian to go out there and compete in Olympics. You know, that was just crazy because it wasn't going to be me trying to get him in shape to mm -hmm. perform in the My thing was to knock him off so I can be the number one guy. So I just made it, I just made it, uh, I just made a decision not to go. I thought that was the best bet for me. I mean, not to go because I was already uh, 
hostile, upset, angry, mad, disappointed, everything under the sun that was me. So I just didn't go. Um, I, of course, I actually went and won a gold medal and got a whole lot of money. But um, when those guys were ready to go to the Olympics, I had already declared that I was going to turn pro. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got a pretty... So, as of August uh, 20th, 1992, I made my professional debut down at uh, Resource in the Lion City. Mm -hmm. I had a first round knockout. And you remember who it was and, and... Roberto Cotto from New York. Yep. And how, how, did, how did you feel getting your first pro victory? Oh, my God. I mean, it was just, I mean, for you... When you're a fighter or you do anything that you do, for you to have, uh, 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 how can you say it? For you to have supporters mm -hmm. is a great thing. And, um, you know, it was just amazing that I had all the people that I had support me. I mean, people I didn't know at all that knew my parents, that followed my career, or just knew me because I was Vivian and James' son. Mm -hmm. Vivian and James and son, that was just great. And when I made my pro debut uh, down at uh down in Atlantic City, you know I wasn't I was from Delaware, you know what I'm saying. So for me to get tickets, uh, for people was like pulling teeth. But my man Jerry Woods, man, he he's such a great guy. I mean, he had who in his now. Uh, he had Tony Martin. He got for Ryan. You know, he's still in a fight game. He still have a lot of fighters, but he was such a, a great guy, man, a lovable dude. He was like a dad to me. Um, you know, he had made sure he reached out to all my friends in the neighborhood, you know what I'm saying? And those guys came down to my first pro fight. It was just, it was just, you know, it was a wonderful thing. And throughout my career, for me to still have love with the people that I had or still do have, and it's in my corner, you know, it, that's a great thing. You know, and I, I've always said that, you know, just... <laughs> that's you? Yeah, it's me. <laughs> okay. And for me just to have a little bit of the recognition that Leonard, Holmes, Muhammad Ali, and those guys to have, man, it's just a great thing. I mean, I don't need to be in the spotlight all the time. But just for people to remember who I was, what I did, and the love, what I've done for the fan. Mm -hmm. Because basically at the end of the day, yeah, you know, I remember my trainers, you know, we talk about it all the time. They remember when I was undefeated, I always said I was never going to be beaten. And it was, it was, with me, it's hard to say. And for, a lot of people probably say, oh, I mean, you bullshit and that. But for me, at the time, with me coming up, fighting was love. It wasn't about the money. Yeah, I wanted to get paid. At the end of the day, I wanted to see, you know, a couple of zeros. And that. But that wasn't what it was about. It was about going in there, competing, and me showing the skills that I've been taught. That's what it's about. And that's not what it's about nowadays. You know, I mean, I got fighters in the gym. I mean, I got guys in the gym that's like 20, 21 years old. They think they know more than me. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm saying like, oh, coach, you can get, won't you come on here? Let me show you something. That you show, what are you going to show me? You mm. can't show me nothing. I'm mm. trying to show you. You So what you talking about? You going to show me? If you can show me something, you don't need me then. That's mm. what I tell my fighters every day. If you feel as though you got to come in the gym and you got to show me something, don't come. Mm. I mean, I'm up to, you know, taking advice. I'm up to, to hearing stuff because um, in the fight game, you never, ever going to learn this fight game because it's too much to learn. So I'm willing to learn something from my fighter. But when you get into that mood that you're talking about, well, you get in the ring with me, let me show you, then you know what? We don't need to be together no more because that's just disrespecting. That's going out your character. And that's not me. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't, I can never, my son is a great basketball player. He's going to get great throughout the years as he gets older. But I can't tell him how to dribble a ball because I can't, I don't know, I mean, I know how to dribble and I know how to shoot because I play, but things that he learned, I, I don't know nothing about it, so it's nothing I can tell him. All I can do is get him in shape, 
Uh, I got a, I got a conditioning coach working with him. I'm saying he goes to the conditioning coach three times a week. I'm saying I run with him. You know what I'm saying? But I can't really tell that man what to do because I don't know the game like that. And he can't tell me what to do about boxing because he don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. so. Yeah. But um, yeah, man. I had you know I had a, a fabulous career. Um, um, you know, and that's that's another thing. My dad always tell me. We talk all the time. He always tell me. He said, you know, you you fought some great fights. Take that. I take nothing away from you with that. But he always say, my my greatest fights were always early in my career. I guess because I was so young. Mm-hmm. Um, I did so much. I was so animated. Mm-hmm. I was such a uh, buzzsaw, you know. And there are a couple fights that I remember, like uh, this kid and Kevin Marston that I fought on, on uh, I think either USA or ESPN. Mm-hmm. Um, the kid was like uh, fourteen and six or fourteen, 14 something like that. 14 I think I'm like twelve and zero, and he was. Uh, I was, of course, I was young and up and coming, and I was kind of high. And this kid had been around. He fought a lot of kids, but he was like on the downside of his career. And he had said to me, and said to my trainers, and I mean, he said, "You really think that your kid at Robinson is gonna beat me? I'm my older guy. I've been around." He said, "If this kid beats me, I'm retired." Hmm. You know. <laughs> so I never really knew that until after the fight. So you know, we went in the fight and um. You know, we were we fought. Now my um now my attributes for me being young as a young fighter was that I was young, you know, athletic, agile, and I had very quick hands. I wasn't a big puncher, but pretty much if I could connect, I could get you out of here. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And um, you know, the kid was in Southpaw, he was giving me trouble and you know, and that's one thing I said that I learned and I loved about my dad. It's like, when my dad talks or he says something, I listen. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And the kid wasn't really beating me, but you can see he was giving me a little trouble. But if you knew me and you knew how I fought, you knew sooner or later I was going to catch up with this kid and I was going, he would beat him or knock him out. And I'll never forget, um, the kid was giving me trouble. And I went back to the corner, and my dad got in, in, in the corner, in between my legs, and he, excuse me, he's like, what the fuck are you doing? You mess around with this kid. I mean, going in, like I said, my attitude was that I had quick hands, and I don't know what it was, but I could throw, I could throw a 20-punch combination in a split of a second. That's just how quick my hands was. Hmm. And my dad told me, he was like, look, you sitting there bullshit with this kid, you gonna let this kid beat you? When well, you should be getting your hands off, hitting him with combination, backing him up, and I guarantee you, if you put your punches together, you can knock this kid out. And it's like whatever my dad said to do, or he asked me to do, I went out there and I did. And he asked me to do it, and I went out there and I did it, and I knocked the kid out. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the fight. At the end of the fight, um, oh, why did he do that? I'm sorry, I'm looking at that. But um, mm-hmm. at the end of the fight, the kid said, "I remember now with um, Al Burns it was on ESPN." Mm-hmm. At the end of the fight, the kid said he beat me. Yeah, I guess I must retire. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I he never, I never knew that. He never said it to me. But evidently he said it to somebody and it got back to my dad. And my dad told me, he said, you know what you did? I said, no, what you talking about? He said, you did what I asked you to do. And on top of that, you went and you retired this kid. Hmm. I was like, what? Hmm. He said, the kid retired. I'm like, stop playing. Said, I'm serious. The kid retired. And I found out later the kid did retire. But, you know, I didn't. I looked at that as a good thing. But I didn't look at it like, ah, I beat the kid up and made him retire. I just, you know, did what I was supposed to do. And I guess the kid felt as though he had no choice. You know, he couldn't do nothing. And once I picked it up and I stepped it up, it was just it was just a, a, a wrap. He couldn't do nothing. Mm-hmm. So, I don't, I don't, so that was that. I don't know if you if you remember it wrong or or if they got it wrong. Box wreck. But it looks here like you 
knock the guy out in one round. I don't know if you know that. Maybe your dad was yelling instructions from the corner. I knocked him out one round? Yeah, I ain't know that. I thought he knocked him out See, two rounds. In your head, you, you got it where it was a tougher fight than it was, but you retired him because you destroyed him. <laughs> wow. You're better than you thought you were. Yeah, right? <laughs> So so uh, when you when you first turned pro you you were trained by who who was your trainer? My well it was crazy because you know um of course I first signed a big lucrative deal for like I think like a million dollars or something like that mm -hmm. and Oscar was the number one guy and I was the number two guy. People didn't think that I was going to get a whole lot of money because I didn't win the gold medal and honestly like I said at that time. Uh, I didn't expect to get a lot of money. It was just about being in the, in the spotlight, being on TV, uh, getting the recognition that people were seeing who I was. So I wasn't really expecting to get no money, which I would have loved to get money, but that wasn't my expectation. My expectation was turn pro and making money. Well, the guy Eddie Woods that I told you was around me since I was like 13, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, he was with my dad every day. With me every day, he used to come by. He, at that time, he used to draw a big Lincoln. And he mm -hmm. came around every day. He used to get me, take me wherever I wanted to go. He used to come to the gym. He had Tony Martin at the time. I used to spar Tony Martin. Mm -hmm. I used to spar uh, Kid Chocolate. I spar Meldrick. I spelled his brother Myron. I spell, I sparred, uh, what did I spar? I sparred a guy named Gregory Tut. Man, I sparred a lot of people. So I was already getting, getting the experience that I needed, getting ready for as a pro. Mm -hmm. So um, what happened, my manager, Eddie, he knew that I was worth money. Now, he, as a, he was a business guy. He, he was the treasurer of 107, local 107 here in Philly. So he had some money. He was, he wasn't a rich guy, but he had money. And I guess he felt though he couldn't give me the money that I needed or the money I was worth. So he got this lady from uh, I want to say she's from Burlington, New Jersey, but she did in Burlington. She had a house out in Bridgegate, New Jersey. So I'm gonna say Bridge Bridgegate, New Jersey, out there by Atlantic City, and she had a company in Jersey called Mother's Kitchen. It was a big, big cheesecake factory. She owned the whole joint. So she had a lot of money. So um, we were trying to find out exactly um, what um, type of money that we were worth. To them. So, you know, they looked out for me. They got me a car. They put me in an apartment, which I already had bought my apartment before they decided to take over the payment to do whatever they did. But I got a, I, at that time I had got a sign up bonus, which I wasn't even, they said I wasn't even supposed to get a sign up bonus. But I got a sign up bonus for $50,000. So you know a kid, 18 years old, no, hold up, I was 18. I was 19, gave a turn 20. A kid 20 years old getting $50,000, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money for a kid that much. What I did, I, I've never been a greedy dude and my dad and my mom always say, that's my problem because I'm not a greedy dude. I try to help as many as people I can. Now, fighters only have two trainers and a cut man. I had three trainers and a cut man and a manager. Hmm. I had my dad, I had Odell Castell, and I had my original trainer, Johnny Southern, which he passed like a year and a half later. And then I had the famous cut man, Eddie Aliano, mm -hmm. my corner. So I had a great team. You know, I had a great team and I felt though being a champion and wanting to become a champion, you only can surround yourself with the best. And that's what I did. And like I said, my manager, Eddie Woods, was a great dude because he took care of Eddie Aliano as far as the cut man. I paid my three trainers and I plus I paid my manager. So, you know, it was good. And the thing about it, the $50,000 was a signing bonus. So what I did, I took the signing bonus money, and I paid my team. Hmm. And I gave, I gave them every, I, I think I gave my dad, I gave, I think I gave my dad like 10000 and I gave both of my trainers like five, and I kept the rest, because at that time I was married. <laughs> mm hmm
you know, mm-hmm. so, you know, um, and uh, my daughter was born. So, you know, we, me and my wife, we did the right thing. We took care of each other. We took care of our house, our home, all that. So, you know, I, I was good. I didn't have no problems. Um, all, I, all I had to worry about was just boxing. Mm-hmm. And that was a good thing. That was a real good thing. Yeah, and and you you mentioned how you you grew up uh, sparring Meldrick Tyler and his brother too. But what was it like sparring with Meldrick Tyler? Well, me and me and Meldrick didn't spar that often because Meldrick was always who do and them always had Meldrick in camp, and I think that was a great thing. And I was wondering when I was going to get a chance to do that too. For one, you know, we lived in the city of Philadelphia. You know, um, Philadelphia was a very uh, Hostile city. Um, you, it, I mean, you try not to get, uh, how you say, you try not to get pulled into the day to day situation that's going on, that was going on in the city, as far as like um, hanging around with bad guys, not exactly doing what they do, but just hanging around them. And, um, you know, I, I wasn't that type of dude, but basically all I did was train, um, spend time with the family. And yeah, I went out every now and then, and I was never the type of person that shot away from fans because I looked at it like this. Fans got me to where I was at, you know what I'm saying? If it wasn't for the fans coming and supporting me, paying any money to come see me, and taking a liking in me, not just in Philadelphia, but throughout the, the world, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be who I am today, you know what I'm saying? Because whether you like it or not, or whether you want to know it or not, your fans are the ones that help you get to where you got to get and get that money for you because if you fight in Vegas, if you don't have an audience, how are you going to get paid? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? If people yeah. ain't turning the TV to watch you, how are the pay-per-view ratings going up? How can you make money off the pay-per-view of the box office off tickets and stuff like that if they don't see you? So, you know, I, I think I had a real great crowd. Um, sparring with Meldrick, it was crazy because I was told that Meldrick had the quickest hand, I guess, in the world. <laughs> but then again, I was told I had him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so when me and Meldrick sparred, it was like, yeah, like, a, like, like how many punches are these guys going to throw in six rounds that they spar? Who's going to get hit the most? <laughs> What I loved about Mudrick, Mudrick had great hand speed, great, great. But what I did like about Mudrick, Mudrick didn't have no defense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What I liked about me, <laughs> I was just an all-around athlete. I was a great boxer. I had great hand speed. I had great head movement. I had great defense. I just couldn't. I just wasn't a big puncher. That's mm-hmm. all. But yeah. if you knew me coming up, I was just a joy to love to watch and see the box. As far as a boxer, Magic wasn't wasn't a uh, wasn't bad himself. Like I said, he was a great dude. You know what I'm saying? I love boxing with him. Um, it was just, it was always competition with us. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying because first of all, Magic lived like four blocks up the street from where I lived at. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it was like you seen Magic, you seen me. Yeah. Uh, people talked about Magic. People talked about me. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it was a good thing. Um, his brother Meyer, mm-hmm. he was a, uh, uh, I really don't want to say it, <laughs> he was a good dude, but he was like a club fighter. Oh, okay. You know what I'm saying? You know, he, <laughs> you just know him by the name of Teller. I mean, he didn't really uh, have too many, I don't even really think if anybody knew Myron to have great, um, great fights in his career, you just know him, like I said, by the name of Teller. Mm-hmm. But he was, he's a great dude. I just seen him two weeks ago in his car now. He's a great, great, great dude. Yeah. Um, How's Meldrick doing, you know? Uh, he's, doing, he's doing pretty good. You know, yeah. I can't, I can't, uh, a couple of years ago he wasn't doing too good, but he's getting himself together now. He's great. That's great. I don't know, God, 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 is, God is good, man. God has helped him, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, after the shot this fight, man, mm. I mean, he took a real, real, real beat, man. And that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, I, that's something that I'm, I could never, I could never get over. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I just pray every day because 
you know, God has blessed me, man. I mean, excuse my expression and shit. I mean, yeah. <laughs> just that one fight alone that I went through with Caddy. Hmm. How many people you know yeah. has come out good? Yeah. I mean, Mickey Ward and Gary have fought in, what, three fights? Yep. I hear Mickey Ward ain't doing too good. Hmm. I mean, he's all right, but I mean, he's not doing too good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, God has uh, blessed me, man. I, I mean, I fought two ruling fights, what, 24 rounds with that kid? Hmm. My yeah. God. And I, I, I haven't watched that fight in about... A year and a half mm-hmm. now, but the last time that I watched it, it was to the point that I was covering my own eyes. Yeah. And I only do that when I watch <laughs> scary movies. But I don't like scary movies. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm sitting there looking at me and this kid exchange punches. I mean, I hit this kid with like three or four solid shots. And then this kid come back and hit me with one solid shot. And I'm sitting there like, wow, hmm. my God, man. And these are shots he would hit other guys with and just, my God, destroy him. Like, I seen, I can't, I think of the first fight, me and him exchanging blows. And I, you know, you know, when, you, when things get good to you, you do stupid things. And I threw, I think a three-punch combination, and I caught Gary yeah, with a good right hand, boom. And he countered with his left hook right on his, on my chin. <laughs> and I seen him hit, uh, uh, what's that kid, uh, Rodriguez on, a, on, on on his chin with a left hook mm-hmm. off a shot, the same shot that I threw. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he came back and hit this kid and knocked him out. Yeah. And I'm sitting there like, wow, did I actually just take this shot from this kid? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then I seen, in the second fight, I mean, this kid uh, hit me with some great body shot. And I'm sitting there saying to myself, although the fight is done over with, I'm sitting there saying, did I actually get hit with that body shot? But, you know, now that I look at it, now I see why, you know, I hate to say it, but I'm not I'm not afraid to say it and I'm not scared to say it or talk about it. But now I see why at the end of, at the, end of the second Gaddy fight, my trainer, Boy Fisher, had me sit in a tub of ice. Hmm. Yeah. You know? You were, you were pissing blood, weren't you? <laughs> yes, I was. Yes, I yeah, was. Those, that, the second Gotti fight, I remember the, the just being amazed with the body punches you were taking. The first fight, he caught you with that left hook late in the fight, and you just... Mm-hmm. Oh, my the, God. That, I, so I love Atlantic City so much, and, you know, I go down there all the time. You know, I got cops and stuff. And, um... It's just crazy how that fight went. The fight went real crazy, man. Yeah. Um, that fight was I actually. Thought I, was, I thought I was on the boardwalk. Yeah, I remember that. I remember you told me that. And yeah, that, he hit me with that up hook man. I was like, Shh, "What the hell am I?" No, and way back early in your career, though, you uh, you fought a guy named Dan Rucker in your fourth pro fight. Uh huh. And and. You fought that fight at the the little garden, the little room in the garden. What was that like? That fighting, was fighting at the little garden already in your fourth man, trophy. First of all, fighting in Madison Square Garden, man, was like shh, like a dream come true. Mm-hmm. Not many people get a chance to fight at um, at the garden. And like I said, at that time, I was with um, Bobby Goodman. Bobby Goodman, man, he's a great dude. Loving the death. You know what I'm saying? He took a chance with me in my career because it was hard getting a promoter. You know what I'm saying? Because some of the my dad and Lou Duva didn't get along. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. My dad just didn't like Lou Duva Wade. And my dad said no matter what, that I wouldn't sign with Lou Duva. Mm-hmm. And Lou Duva wanted me after he signed, well, after he thought he signed an Oscar. Mm-hmm. But I guess that was his, uh, his, um, I should have said his, uh, his rebound. Mm-hmm. Since he couldn't get Oscar, he would come out to me. But my dad didn't like Lou Duda. And my mm-hmm. dad didn't want me to be with Lou Duda. So, you know. Mm-hmm. My thing is, I'm a young kid. I'm, I'm, I'm 20. I'm almost what you consider a grown man. But regardless, this is a fight game that's blue. This is a fight game that you really got to know what you're doing. And who's, who better to have that I know is going to protect me, even if it's a bad situation. 
was going to take me better than my dad. So mm -hmm. my dad said, no, he didn't want us with, with do He wanted me with Eddie Woods. And it wasn't too many, I don't think it was too many other people call it. Uh, Bruce Tramlin, who was with a top rank at the time, he, he was on my heels like for the last two years. He was on my heels real tough. Me and him grew up a great relationship, but I didn't sign with him. I signed with Eddie. Mm -hmm. And one thing about it, see, back then, those promoters understood that when you signed with somebody else or you went with somebody else, they understood it was good. But nowadays, no, I think it's not happening that way. The fight game is definitely different. Things are definitely uh, uh, not secure. Mm -hmm. That's a bad thing. But, um, damn, Paul Walker, uh, uh, didn't know much about it. No. Actually, didn't know nothing about it. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, my dad was a good, was a great trainer. Yeah. And, and he's, he's one of the best. And my dad just looked at him at doing the fight and told me what I should and what I shouldn't do mm -hmm. and how we were going to um, prepare because you know that early in your career you don't uh, you don't um, get to know the guys that you fight all you know is that they're there that you're going to fight them and that they come in the fight you know and you got to be ready mm -hmm. And yeah. that's basically what it was. My, no matter what, who he was fighting, how good they were, or what the outcome was, my dad always had me ready. So I could have fought King Kong. Mm -hmm. I was ready, though. My dad made sure I was ready. Well, thankfully, you were never pitted against King Kong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Hopefully, I'd never fight King Kong. <laughs> yeah. I know you would, though. But then, uh. Would. Yeah. So, so. It, it wasn't long after you turned pro, though. You already became like a like a poster child, poster boy for Tuesday Night Fights and ESPN. What was that like? Yeah, it was, yeah, that was man, that was crazy because um, it's crazy. I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't really, you know, and and when you when you're a fighter and when you when you when you're a fighter when you're an ex fighter, uh, two things you you become either. An icon in the sport, or you become a nobody. And Sean O'Grady was a, a, a I don't want to say a Gaddy because he fought nothing like Gaddy, but he was like a Gaddy because he was a guts and war guy, mm -hmm. and he could fight a little bit. So Sean O'Grady had a little reputation, mm -hmm. and I grew on his reputation. That was like my guy mm -hmm. when we first met, when I first did a Tuesday night fight, it's like we connected. Yeah. And it was crazy because we connected and we talked and we hit it off. And I found myself fighting like every month on a Tuesday night. Hmm. And I never dawned to ask my manager why I'm having so many TV fights. I didn't even really care. The thing was, I was fighting on TV and then I never really dawned on why was I fighting in Philadelphia so much. Mm -hmm. It didn't dawn on me. I didn't care. All I knew was that I had a home face, face band. I mean, home base. Company mm -hmm. and fans mixed, no matter what, Puerto Rican, white, black, yellow, I had a fan base. And they was loving to come see me. But the Blue Rising was an icon. It was a legend. So yeah. I didn't care about fighting it. All I know is when I go down Broad Street and I was getting ready to get out of the car and go in the arena, I got much love. Mm -hmm. And I was going to see my man Sean O'Grady. Yeah, yeah, those were the days. Just a, and I just never, it was just, a, it was just never a night that I didn't perform for Tuesday Night Flight. I always had an AB rating mm -hmm. by Sean O'Grady, you know. Mm -hmm. it was, I never had a dull fight, but to me, the only dog fight that I think I had, the only two dog fights I think I had was when I fought for my USBA title, when I fought Demetri Sabalas, and mm -hmm. the kid, he was the only kid, even my dad said it, he was the only kid I ever known that kept the same composure, his face never changed mm -hmm. throughout the whole fight. I mean, 
he was relentless. He kept coming. He kept coming. And we knew that. You know, we knew he kept coming. And the thing about it was, you know where I went to get ready for this fight? Where's that? Deer Lake. I went up, huh? Deer Lake. Who? Where'd you go? <laughs> oh, I went to, uh, damn, New York. Where, um, where Al Sir was from? I can't remember where Al Sir. But he trained mm -hmm. Buddy McGirt. Yeah, yeah. I went up there. I went up there and trained. Mm -hmm. And Al Sir and Buddy McGirt fell in love with me. And who would have known that my matchmaker, Carl Moretti, had something to do with Buddy McGirt. And the reason they brought Buddy McGirt in the train, in Philadelphia for me, and the semi fight was because he wanted to bring Buddy McGirt on my team. But at the time, I didn't have enough room, and I didn't want to be sorry to my team or be big heads and be talking about moving people around. So I stuck with my with the guys that I was with from day one. Mm. But I think it would have been a good addition to have Buddy McGirt because why? Mm. Even though Buddy McGirt mm -hmm. was the same size I was, I think. No, I think I was talking about McGirt. He boxed real good. Yeah. And ironically, he was the man in Arturo Gotti's corner when you fought Gotti. Yeah. Well, he came after Gaddy. I mean, after me and Gaddy. Oh, did he? But, yeah, he, he wasn't in the corner when I fought Gaddy. Oh, okay. My bad. But, um, me and Buddy McGirt got into it because, um, yeah, because when Buddy, Buddy McGirt came into Gaddy's career, people said yes. that Buddy McGirt changed Gaddy's life. Mm -hmm. He did. Yep, yep. But still... Yeah. I say that Buddy McGurk would have never beat me. Mm -hmm. Never beat me. Daddy, he couldn't, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have did nothing. Because <laughs> you bless. couldn't tell Daddy nothing to beat me. Just couldn't. Mm -hmm. And Buddy McGurk had that, 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 that squirrel. Mm -hmm. So, and I was hoping for a third fight. Which I know wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. Because I beat Gaddy twice. Why would he fight me again? Yeah. I know I wouldn't have. But, you know, it would have been nice, but it didn't happen. Yeah, so you were the reason. Kind of glad it did. Because, mm -hmm. <laughs> excuse my point, my first, them goddamn punches. Them first two fights was enough for a lifetime. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. So, so you're, you're fighting uh, on Tuesday Night Fights on ESPN and... And, and then you fight. Uh, I remember. I remember you fought Demetrius Sabalos. What happened in that fight? You, that was the first time you were cutting a fight, wasn't it? Yeah, that's that the first time I was cutting a fight. Um, but you know what? I don't. Um, it's crazy how um, even my ex-wife, all my brothers, well, my two brothers, um, I don't have no sisters, but I call them my guys. Everybody that know me know that. I'm a punk, like, I don't like no pain, um, <laughs> I hate to be sore, but everybody always asking how was I a fighter, man, look, I don't know, God put me on the dirt to become a fighter, and that's what I became, mm. now I'm a regular dude, I don't know, but, um, that cut was something kind of crazy, mm. that, um, yeah. you put it with, you alright, alright, that cut was something kind of crazy, because, i never been cut before, and um, it was just new. But God forbid that, um, you know, I worked through it. I did what I had to do. Um, he, like I said, um, he never changed his, his facial expression. Yeah. He just always had that, that, that stone face, that stone face uh, killer attitude. Mm -hmm. um, and um, he just kept coming. Kept coming, kept coming. And, um, you know, we tried to box and box and box. But, you know, that's one thing that um, people critique me on. And I'm, I'm, I'm not the type of person that get mad if you critique me and it's a, is a, is a right thing. Only way I get mad if you try to put me in a situation or try to blackball me or make me out to be something that I'm not. Um, Anybody tell you, you can, you, I know you know that for yourself because you, you've been around the game a long time. I, the only thing I considered that was wrong with me was that I was the type of guy, I could box and 
brains off. I could be boxing your brains off for, for God knows how long. And just for some reason, I would get macho. And I would just have to, you know, bite you. Like, the whole game plan with Getty was to box his brains out. He couldn't box us. Mm -hmm. There was no way he could box us. But, you know, like before the fight, I don't know what the heck happened. I don't know if I slipped some angel bets or something, or something happened. But right before the run out, I told my, my, my team, I was like, all right. We fighting this guy. What? We fighting this guy. Man, we been boxing all week. We don't, we don't know nothing about him. We ain't gonna fight. Man, see other guys later. We fighting this guy. And I went in there and I fought him. Mm -hmm. The same way with Sabalas. I think I boxed Sabalas superb for like the first three, four rounds. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what happened. I don't know if I got cut, if I got caught. I don't know what happened. But I know it was like I was in cement. I started being right there and start slugging with him mm -hmm. and that wasn't a good thing but the thing about that was that I had the quicker hands and regardless of what you said about me I was always the better technician of any fighter that I fought mm -hmm. so my technique was always good I just had to perform good and um I gave some bows angles you know and I'm good with angles Mm -hmm. I do angles very well. Yep. Oh, I got good good hand speed. I got pretty good of a body movement. And I think that helped me. Mm -hmm. um, of course, a lot of people say that I got the hometown uh, decision. Mm -hmm. hey, that might be true, but I wasn't crying. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think I might have deserved it. Yeah, you know, yeah. that I've been around so long. Yeah. I've done so much, you know. So, but, um, you know. The most important thing is that it was a success for uh, USA, mm. and of course they brought me back again. <laughs> and, uh, like that? I said, I think it was like every month I was fighting on yeah. USA. Yeah, it was consistent. And and, and you fought Sabalos, a, a war that was a war, and, and it was in in a place like the Blue Horizon in Philly. I know, what's right? It, what's uh, it like fighting? What fighting I don't want to get sucked into all this stuff, man. Yeah. I smoke cigars, cigarettes, drinking beer. <laughs> ah, come on. <laughs> what's that like, though? That fighting, fighting in a place like that where everyone's I mean, on top of you. It, it, I mean, it, it, like I said, it, it's fabulous. It's um, it's a world, it's a, it's a dream come true. It's a world situation that a lot of people want to be. Man, I mean, I've known guys like uh. Me and Antoine Echoes, we, we good friends. Mm -hmm. He wanted to come and fight in a Blue Horizon. Yeah. When he right, mm -hmm. wanted to come and fight in a Blue Horizon. And I'm sitting there saying, yo, y'all guys want to come and fight a little small arena where it's nothing but smoke, mm -hmm. uh, drinking beer, and if you mess around and you don't perform well, they might mess around and throw their beer at you in the ring. Yeah. Yep. I mean, that's how the Philly fans, that's how the fans are. Yeah, what's that's the, how they are. That's right. They're hot, hot tempered. Sports city. Oh God, was it? Man? Yeah, man. It's hot before you get in there. <laughs> yeah. Come a day, yeah. then you get in there and you fight up under the lights. It's even hotter. So when you get in there, it's about it might be a hundred outside. It might be four hundred in the rain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the truth. It's hot. Yeah, you're right. And and you fought Sabalos. That was for your first professional title. Did you did you fight with more machismo? I guess fighting for your first title. Were you nervous? Oh, um, I think so. Yeah. You know, I think that's what it was. I won. I fight for a title. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be greedy. And <clears throat> you know, the thing about you fighting in your backyard, man. You, you know, you wanna you wanna do it all. You wanna give it all. Mm -hmm. I'm saying you wanna do whatever. And um, I think I got caught up. And he knew that, you know. But yeah, how many how many stitches did did it require to close that? My God, I got um um I think I got eight in and six out. I got sold inside and sold outside, and I never forget um when I went to the hospital, everybody had just seen the fight, so everybody was mm -hmm. waiting for me to come because for some reason. Um, you know, when you get cut and everything, they broadcast it on TV. You know, and they was like, oh, he cut it. But Eddie Aliano, like I said, was my cut man. Mm -hmm. And he took care of the cut. You know what I'm saying? I, had, I didn't have to worry about nothing. Um, I didn't really, it wasn't really a real, real bad cut where 
It was like blood coming down my eye and I was blocking my vision. Eddie Ariano did a great job. The only thing was that um, it was staying burning because I guess because of the sweat mm-hmm. that was getting in it, but that was cool. But I never forget, um, they, uh, I got an escort down to Hanlon Hospital. My best friend Rennie and I was in there. My dad, my whole team was in there. The only person didn't come was my wife, and she didn't bring my daughter. But everybody was there. I never forget. I get in the room, and I'm talking to the lady nurse, I guess, or the lady that preps you for everything. You know, she's talking to me. She like, you know, uh, you looked nice on TV. Looks real good. You did your thing. Now you gotta come in here. We gotta stitch you up. So I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm really saying to myself, will you just shut up and get the work done? You know, I know it's already gonna be a bad situation. Man, when she mm-hmm. went in the bag and got all the tools and stuff, man, she came out here with these two big ass needles. <laughs> man, I damn near fainted because I don't like needles. Mm-hmm. I don't like no pain. I, one time I didn't like to fly, but flying is cool now. And when she stuck that needle in my forehead to go up in that cut, mm. oh my God, it was like she was sticking the needle all the way in my brain. Mm, then when she pushed the needle in and she um, injected the whatever she injected, and mm. my brain swelled up so quickly, it was crazy. Mm. But it numbed the, uh, the cut because when the doctor came to do the uh, surgery, Man, he bought the, first I couldn't believe it. He bought these scissors and he cut inside my cut over my eye. I could hear scissors cutting, like crunch, crunch. crunch. I was like, oh my God, is he actually doing it? Then I seen him take the little, uh, what is it, uh, the hook needle Mm -hmm. and start stitching me up. I'm like, oh my God, is you serious? But when he got done, I couldn't even tell that uh, that um they did anything. He did mm-hmm. such a great job, and I didn't really feel nothing. I guess because I don't know what Novocaine or something. Mm-hmm. Whatever they shot in my head, man, mm-hmm. man, that thing mm-hmm. had my brain like a goddamn basketball. <laughs> so you know, it worked though. God forbid, that's the only cut I ever had. Well, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, well, not really, but that's the that's the. Uh, I would say the worst cut because I had to get stitches. I got another cut right before Yaddy. Mm-hmm. And my cut man at the time was me out there. He said that I needed to get butterflies put on it. But uh, the butterflies I got put on it, they came off because they had to give, they got me a mask. Mm-hmm. But the mask would have been supposed to have been protecting the cut. But what happened, it was... Uh, it was uh, rubbing the, uh, the band-aid off, and when it rubbed the band-aid off, the cut reopened, so that knocked me out of that same multi-fight. I was getting ready for that same multi-fight. Yeah. After, after the Sabalos fight, though, the, you, you uh, a couple fights later, you fought Emmanuel Augustus, Augustus and he was only 8-5-2 yeah. and two at the time. You didn't he know what 8-5-2 and two he was. And, and no one could have known he, he was going to be as tough as he was. What would you think when you're fighting a guy 8-5-2 and two and he's ends up being Emmanuel Augustus? First of all, like I said again, um, coming up the time that I came up mm-hmm. and me being a guy, I didn't really matter. Well, I didn't, you know what? I never knew Augustus' record. Mm-hmm. He just told me. I never knew his record. And I never knew he was that tough. But after that fight, you know, I had to sit back and think. Because you know how you hear all kind. Of, oh, excuse me, Chris. You know how you hear all kinds of crazy um, tactics about your promoter, your your matchmaker, this that and other. And it was kind of crazy that the way I was looking at it, I was just looking at it, and there was no other way to look at. It. I was being tested each and every time I was getting in a fight. For one, I couldn't punch. For two, I think that. Carl Moretti and Bobby Goodman knew that they had something great on their hands, but they didn't know how great, so they wouldn't have knew how great unless they tested the waters. And I think that's what they were doing to me because I was so young. And then, damn, I fought uh, 
Uh, for Philip Holiday in what, 96? Yep, December 96. How many fighters, how many fighters do you know get a world title shot four years of their career? Yeah. Yeah. Successful amateur, I'll tell you that. Shit, wow, mm -hmm. thank you very much. You gotta be something special yeah. to, get, to do that. Huh? You gotta be something special to do that. Plus, the fans loved you. Yeah, yeah. definitely. You know, I mean, I'm just. I'm just a lovable guy, Chris. I know all the type of stuff don't really, you know, bug me too much, but now that you, you said it, you mentioned it, I really got to think about it. I mean, I, I, I feel though I, I was really pretty decorated. I just didn't know how to go about it or think about it. Mm, yeah, I guess you can't at the time, you know? You can't yeah, think I, about it. Yeah. It does something to you when you start thinking. <laughs> yeah, but see, that's why you sort of have good friends like yourself in guys' corners like young fighters like myself that was coming up at the time or coming up now because you don't want to exactly miss out on what's happening later than getting what you're supposed to get at the time. Which I don't, trust me, I don't regret my career not one time. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I do regret is that the simple fact I went through what I went through with my parents for eight to nine years and that um, I let my dad go. Because mm -hmm. I still sit to this point. I just talked to this young lady about last night. If I, I still say, if I would have never got rid of my dad, I'd be undefeated. And I probably would still be fighting right now. I probably would have messed around and fought with Mayweather maybe a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what kind of relationships do you have with your dad when you got your first title shot with Philip Holiday? Well, me and my dad wasn't together. I got rid of my dad after Emmanuel Gus's fight. Mm -hmm. And I still believe that's why I lost that world title fight. Because we had Tommy Brooks and Tommy Brooks didn't know what he was doing. Yeah. So so you, you But Tommy Brooks just got he was just coming off that high with Eric with uh Junior Jones beating Eric Morales. I mean down Mark Brad and Tonya Brad. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the camp looked at like look, what other decorated trying to have? Besides, you know, Tommy Brooks. Mm -hmm. So I went along with it, but it was a bad thing to do. I and mean, what was camp like with Tommy Brooks? Um, camp was crazy because mm -hmm. basically I never spent no genuine time with Tommy Brooks because he was with Junior Jones all the time, and they trained separate from what I did. I trained with Cornell, mm -hmm. uh, Gaddy. Yeah. Harry Pena. Wow. Uh, that's somebody else. I can't remember. Oh, David Tua. Hmm. That's some some incredible camp right there. <laughs> what was that like training with Purnell? What? Man, that camp was crazy as all heck. Yeah. That camp was crazy. Too much to juggle, right? We, we boxing, get yeah, we boxing Purnell. Yeah. I'm saying, man, oh my God, it's just a crazy camp. No, it's all like? getting into. What's sparring Purnell like in 1996? Uh, it was, uh, as the dream come true, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a true lesson. It was a, a lesson learned. Mm -hmm. Uh, because no matter what you say, he was, and is still one of the greatest. Mm-hmm. Always uh, And it was just, it was just thrilling. And, you know, excuse my question, but to get <laughs> to get my behind handed to me by a, kid, a guy like Purnell, mm -hmm. man, I could never be ashamed of that. Yeah. But then to come back the next day and hand my ass to him <laughs> a silver platter, <laughs> and I couldn't do nothing but be the sweetest thing in the world. Yeah. How how hard is it to hit Purnell? Good. Very hard. Yeah. Very, very hard. <laughs> the math of not being hit. Yeah. Yep. That's an amazing camp. What was, what was, uh, did you have any kind of relationship with Gotti at all in that camp? Nah, not at the time. Me and Gary didn't, didn't start really gelling until we went to Arizona. Mm. All three of my camps that I went to were with Purnell. In Norfolk, Virginia, his backyard, and, uh, in um, Arizona, and in uh, in San 
Antonio, where for my first time, I got to meet David Robinson, my brother. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, yep. incredible camps, huh? It, yes, it was. What was your What was your relationship like with uh, David Tua? Anything with him? Well, me and David Tua, we just swung out together, man. Always swung out, always wrestling. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He always pinning me down, making me mad. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> other than that, man, we <laughs> and it was great, man. It was great. Yeah, he actually he actually tried to save a guy from from being attacked by a, a pet tiger. So <laughs> the the guy could could wrestle a tiger. Not an easy huh? thing. David Tua. David Tua yeah, had a guy uh, being attacked by a tiger, and he wrestled the tiger to try to save the guy, but he couldn't. <laughs> so is that what David Tua did? David Tua was pinning you down, you said? Wow, yeah. yeah. He used to, what I used to do, I used to sneak him out. I know he was a big boy. Yeah. He, he, used to, uh, he used to love doing a lot of push-ups all the time. Yeah. But like, if I ran out of the room, he would try to do like 50 push-ups. Mm -hmm. And then when I come back in and talk to him and try to say, oh man, I just did 50 push-ups, man. And I, I can't, I can't do that. I was like, all right. So one day, we got, I got up real early and I told him I was just going to walk out to, uh, down to the hall. But what happened was he wasn't paying me no attention. And I seen that he wasn't. So I opened the door and I ran in the bathroom and the door shut. As soon as he went to go do his push-ups, I jumped off the bed and jumped on his back. <laughs> and was trying to wrestle with him. No, I can't wrestle with his big ass. And he flipped me over. And I bounced off one bed onto the next bed. And he waited for me to come down. When I came down, he just stayed right on top of me and wouldn't get off. I was like, yo, I can't breathe, man. I can't breathe. <laughs> he was like, I'm like, get off me, man. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm not letting you go. I said, man, I cannot breathe. He just held me down, held me down. I had to fuck around and call Lou to come get me because he wouldn't get off me. <laughs> Embarrassing. This guy. Humiliating. <laughs> but he, yeah, but he's lovable by heart, man. He's a strong Real guy. lovable by heart. Yeah, great guy. Yeah. Okay. Tell me tell me about the fight with, with Philip Halde. You, you get to the fight and, and you got your new trainer. What, what What's it like, Tommy Brooks in your corner? Um, Take me through uh, that fight. I just, uh, I just was, um, uh, Gonna go in there and um, well, basically when you you know when you when you were a season pro and for some reason you know I was being called a season pro before I even turned pro, mm. but at that age, by that stage right now, I'm what? Excuse me, I'm 23 now. Mm -hmm. Ain't really too much Tommy Brooks can tell me. I mean, I was telling Tommy Brooks in the final week or two of the camp. I was telling Tommy Brooks exactly what I was going to do to counter Holiday's arsenal. Mm -hmm. What he was going to do. You know, it was nothing that was too enhancing to remember. It's just that he threw a lot of punches. Mm -hmm. A lot of punches. And he didn't fight you. Tireless guy. He, he rode bikes and marathons back in South Africa. Uh, yeah, he definitely did. And none of that really, uh, none of that really, um, mattered to me, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I guess what I loved about it, regardless of people say I couldn't break eggs and none of that, what thrilled me, what really made me notice that everything was good around the world and what people know about him, his manager was still scared of me. Even though he was the champion and I was number one, his trainer was actually afraid that he was going to lose his title. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously he should have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Should have. That belt should have been strapped around my waist. 